Welcome to the Innovation in Economic Development panel discussion. If we could just ask that everybody take your seats. I realize that we're getting ready to have lunch and we're running a little bit behind, so we would like to get started. Good morning again. I'm Kelly Smallridge, CEO of the Economic Development Board in Palm Beach County, and it has been fascinating to hear the discussions this morning regarding workforce, infrastructure, population, and economic growth. And the economic growth and, eco and innovation issue is something that we would like to discuss this morning, especially prior to breaking out into our sessions to discuss a comprehensive economic development strategy. I think it's important for everyone to really understand the job growth side of it. And I look at my friends here on the stage and I look at all of you out there. If you could picture that those of us who serve on the front line of economic development every day, we're out there working with the recruitment, the retention, the expansion of companies interested in our respective counties, as well as fostering entrepreneurs and fostering innovation, we're on the job side, the capital investment side. For those of you, so we're on the sales and marketing. That's what we do. For those of you that are elected officials or you work for government and you're in the, in the engineering side, you are in the design and engineering component. So we're sales and marketing, you're design and engineering. And it's very important that as we have the discussion and go into our sessions that you understand this probably greatest migration of companies and people that I've ever seen in the, three, in the last three decades. Um, just to give you a little snapshot, and I, I would be remiss if I just didn't share with you um, what I see in Palm Beach County. 11,000 net new people moved to our county last year with 41% alone coming from New York City. And with that 41%, $3.4 billion walked with them. What is scary, but also very positive, is as Class A office buildings that used to go for $35 a square foot are now up to $75 a square foot. And before they come out of the ground, they are 45% leased. And any new office building that went up right after COVID is 100% leased. Now, I also want you to think about this. There's 1.5 million square feet of brand new office space that is planned for Palm Beach County and about 2 million brand new square feet of light industrial space plan for just this county. Why is it important to everyone here? Because it will spill out into our respective counties in an eight county region. What happens in Indian River, St. Lucie and Martin impacts Miami, Broward and Miami-Dade. For us to think that all of the growth is in one county, we are fooling ourselves. People may work in Palm Beach County, but we joke that our housing is really in Martin and St. Lucie, but it is the truth. And so those roads, the transportation, and all the infrastructure has to be in alignment. So I'll move into our discussion. I am joined by my esteemed panel of uh, gentlemen that I've had the great pleasure of knowing many of them for a long time. Their bios are in your program, so we can skip that. And I've been asked to end by 1210. So let's start with Andrew Duffel is the president of the research park at FAU. My counterpart in St. Lucie is Pete Tesh, who's the president of the Economic Development Council of St. Lucie. Tom Kindred is the regional director of the Small Business Development Center. And my friend to my right is Destin Wells. He's the senior VP of business development of Enterprise Florida. Each of them have a very different role in their county, but a very important role in the economic development ecosystem. So very briefly, so that our audience understands how everything connects, whether it's Small Business Development Center to innovation and entrepreneurship or economic development and then the state. Why don't you give everybody just a one to two minute overview of the role that you play? Start with me, Kelly. Well. Uh Thank you very much. I'm Pete Tesh, president of the St. Lucie EDC. It's uh, great to be here with you. And Kelly, thank you for being our moderator. And it's great to be with um, my good friends and all of you. Um, Kelly is uh, economic development royalty in Florida. You know, uh, being an uh, economic development practitioner, there's an opportunities to have your future freed up and to do other things. Uh, I was like one of the original uh, gig workers uh, being an um, economic development consultant and uh, working from home back in uh, 2012, 2013. And, you know, Kelly talked about the tremendous economic growth going into Palm Beach County, but, 
you know, there I was uh, in front of my uh, laptop and my, my cell phone and my jammies and my slippers, and I saw uh, Kelly on uh, CNBC uh, talking, uh, you know, to the, uh, the, the anchors about the tremendous growth going on in Palm Beach County and the attraction of, of hedge fund managers. So anyway, it was, that was so cool. Uh, that may not have anything to do with uh, my role or responsibility in economic development, but I thought I would share it with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it just shows you uh, the, uh, from a state level, and uh, Destin Wells uh, with Enterprise Florida is here, but the, um, the, just the marvelous transformation of the Florida economy. And uh, David Gillespie was here talking about us being a uh, economy in Florida, the 10th largest in terms of GNP, uh, GDP, as well as if we were a sovereign nation. So anyway, lots of uh, cool things going on in the Treasure Coast in St. Lucie County. Um, we've had tremendous uh, economic development, job creation, um, and the couple of things I would like to point out that over the last five years we've done 49 projects in manufacturing, distribution, logistics, um, it's created uh, 5,000 new jobs, and will create another 10,250 jobs when you look at direct, indirect, and induced. So we have a tremendous challenge in, in terms of providing um, a skilled workforce for these different type of operations. Kelly talked about uh, you know, the amount of commercial office space and industrial space. Currently in St. Lucie County, uh, four and a half million square feet of new industrial uh, warehousing is going up, four and a half million. Um, along with that, we're also seeing uh, uh, another four million of industrial and commercial space to go up. So we have a, a lot of work to do. Um, keeps me up at night, but one thing that it's very important is uh, partnerships, and a lot of my board members are here. Uh, the chairman of the St. Lucie Economic Development Council, uh, Chris Fogel, is here, and many of my board members, Mark Satterley, Marshall Critchfield was here, uh, Tammy Matthew, uh, and Brian Bauer, and uh, we have a great partnership. So anyway, we do economic development, and I'll shut up. I won't feel as constrained because none of my board members are here this morning. <laughs> so good morning. As Kelly said, my name is Andrew Duffel. I'm the president of the Research Park at Florida Atlantic University, which happens to be located in Boca Raton at the southern end of this region. But while FAU itself is very much a regional university, the Research Park is also a regional asset, and we're the only research park affiliated to a state university south of Orlando. And think of us as a place where ideas meet researchers and, and entrepreneurs who can commercialize those ideas into products and services that are then put into the marketplace throughout this whole region. We have companies that have started with us in Boca Raton that are now operating in Fort Pierce, uh, in Aquaco, for example. We have companies that move south into to Broward. We have companies that move to Jupiter. So we are becoming and um, are sometimes called South Florida's laboratory for new ideas and, and technologies. We've tried to broaden our appeal and make sure that we're bringing not only technology that is created and discovered by researchers at FAU, but also from overseas so that we inject new intellectual capital into our economy as well as financial capital from overseas so that we grow the pie rather, rather than just churning U.S. money and create net new jobs rather than relocating companies from elsewhere, create new jobs for people who already live in this region who are the students who are doing AS and AA degrees at Palm Beach State and Indian River State College so that uh, they can uh, put those new technologies to use and create more value in our economy so that it continues to grow. So while we are at the southern end of the region, we very much are and think of ourselves as a regional player and try to collaborate as much as possible with the Business Development Board, the BDB of Martin County, and of course the EDC of St. Lucie County. Tom Kindred, I serve as the uh, regional director for the Florida Small 
Business Development Center at Indian River State College. We are a federally funded program through the SBA. Our, our mission and mandate is to provide credentialed uh, business consulting to the small business community. Uh, uh, we serve the same footprint that the college serves, Indian River, St. Lucie, Martin, and Okeechobee County. Within the ranks of our program, I have specialists. I have government contracting specialists. I have an international trade specialist. We have finance specialist, uh, digital marketing specialist. Uh, so again, a very powerful program. I like to tell folks all the time that it's so easy for me to talk about the SBDC and understand the value of this program because I spent 25 years in private enterprise. I never knew about the SBDC. Uh, there's a very good likelihood, had I known about it, had I used it, I may still be in private enterprise today. Um, but an incredibly powerful value-added program. Uh, our partnerships are, are also um, uh, very valuable to us. We, we work very closely with all the, the EDOs across the Treasure Coast. Uh, Helene Castletine is here. Uh, Joan Goodrich may be here. I did not see Joan. And, of course, Pete and uh, Kaylee King in Okeechobee County. Um, so, anyway, incredible program and appreciate this opportunity to be part of the panel. Got to make sure it's on. Uh, well, hello to everyone. Really appreciate all of you being here. Um, you know, this is a really great example of how communities come together uh, to pursue the goals of economic development, create opportunities for our family, friends, neighbors. Uh, so thank you for letting me be here with you and for your participation today. Uh, I'm Destin Wells, Senior Vice President of Business Development at Enterprise Florida. Enterprise Florida is the principal economic development organization for the state of Florida. Uh, we cover a lot of ground. So we have International Trade Division that helps companies export. We have MASBEC, which does minority and small business support, training and grants. Uh, we have the Florida Opportunity Fund, which is the state's venture capital firm. Uh, I oversee business development, which is what most of us would consider kind of more the, the bread and butter economic development. So my team uh, is responsible for working with companies considering expansion or relocation in the state of Florida. Um, we also have a strategic initiatives part of our office, which handles really curating the ecosystem of economic development, partnerships with our local EDO partners, with the service providers. I'm an SBDC alum, by the way. Um, it's a great organization. Um, but we do a lot of work on marketing the state, selling the state, project management, working with companies coming through the process, while always keeping an eye and a mind towards the broader picture of what's going on so that we can identify the trends uh, and perhaps get in front of the curve and make sure that we're capturing as much of that positive activity and economic shifts that we've been seeing lately here to the benefit of our state. Um, did have a stint in local economic development, four years in Sarasota County, so cut my teeth on the, the, the local level as well, which learned a heck of a lot. Thought I knew a bunch. I was at the state before and I thought I knew everything. I didn't know a damn thing. I went to the local level, really got schooled up, and came back to the state last summer and, and just really fortunate to be there. I, and some people may feel the same way, but I will challenge you. I do truly have the best job. And um, again, uh, feel fortunate to serve in the capacity and happy to be here to have this discussion with you. So now that you understand the respective roles that each of the organizations serve in our counties, um, let's dive into a series of questions, especially knowing that we're going to be developing a SEDS plan uh, later this afternoon. Let's talk about the fact that we are seeing the greatest migration of companies and people and wealth. We all know that the roads are very clogged. We have some really big challenges and we don't win every client. There are some issues, really big issues that we are facing in, in bringing companies to the finish line. A matter of fact, I, I, I would say that I've received a couple of calls from companies who thought, I'm definitely moving to Florida, but now that I've come into your region or your area, there are some things that are causing me to take a step back and not move into your area for these reasons. Let's talk about those reasons so that when we plan, we can hit the issues head on. So Pete, why don't you talk about some of the obstacles that you face or that you see? Thank you, Kelly. Uh, obviously, the uh, talent uh, acquisition and technical training issue is prevalent. Um, you know, when, when you look at uh, the various industry sectors that we're working with, uh, manufacturing, distribution, healthcare, the skilled trades, 
um, it is, uh, to me, overwhelming. So uh, being able to work both with the public and private sector, our training service providers, uh, our academic institutions, to do that, uh, to make sure that we can uh, provide that workforce uh, is critical. Um, Kelly, and I'm sure Destin, you see this all the time, uh, being able to uh, supply the workforce and the human talent element is probably either the first or second question um, that has to be answered and it has to be answered completely. Now you have to prove that um, whether it's a manufacturing operation, uh, whether it's a back office uh, or headquarters, you have to prove to the company, whether it's new and expanding, that you have the individuals that can take uh, that place in, in the workforce. So uh, I'll stop right there because I think that one has some other uh, discussion items, but definitely all of us working together to try to solve that equation here regionally is going to be critical for us to going forward. So I think the, the talent question is, is, is extremely important. It's something we see even in the research park at FAU, which is adjacent to 30,000 undergraduate students. Um, so one of our key roles is to make the opportunities aware or make the opportunities that are available aware, uh, make them known to the students and make sure that our companies know that we have talented students. And that communication hasn't happened to the extent that it needs to yet. I think we need all to do a much better job of informing K through 12 students that amazing companies and amazing opportunities exist in this region and have them in the schools talking about the technologies they're working on and the kinds of opportunities that exist for them and tour some of these companies from time to time. And by the same token, have the companies be aware of the quality of education and be more involved in the development of the curriculum so that the students are learning the kinds of skills that they will need uh, to be good employees later on down the road. So the talent question is extremely important. We've got a lot of people who graduate from a, a state college or, or a university and decide or, or think that they have to leave and go to Atlanta or Boston to get a good high-tech job. They haven't been um, communicated that the opportunities exist here in this region. So that's something very, very important that we need to work on. So I'll leave that talent question too because there are others, but I think this is a big subject to continue on. So I'll, I'll hit on the challenge. I got a couple for you. So I think that it's, um, it's a great thing that Florida is experiencing the growth that we are. The, the net influx of folks, of companies, of that economic impact has really done a lot of great things in our economy and created some opportunities. There's always the other side of that coin. So I think it's, it's when we talk about challenges, maybe I'd frame it as shrinking competitive advantage. Uh, in the state of Florida, cost has always been a competitive advantage for us, whether that was the cost of real estate, our tax structure. I mean, we had a, a very sound business case. Those cost structures are shifting dramatically and quickly based on this growth. The constraints of real estate means that the price per square foot is going up. The construction inputs, everything is getting more expensive. Housing, uh, affordable housing, right? I mean, everybody knows about affordable workforce housing and how big of a challenge that is, not just in southern Florida, not just in Florida, not just in the country. I mean, this is a challenge everywhere, right? But our cost of living index, you know, 100 is the benchmark for the country. Florida's always hovered just a little bit below it, right? Now, some regions locally will spike much higher. Uh, but as a state, we've been comparatively affordable. Well, we're now above 100. We've crossed that line. And now we are more expensive than the rest of the country on average. A lot of context that depends on where you're coming from defines what you think is expensive. Thus, the reason we have such an influx from New York and from Chicago and some of those other really high cost markets. So, so that growth and then the associated challenges there, I think, is a big part. The infrastructure, moving people and goods, and increasingly information. I think that has to be considered, people, goods, and information. How we're moving them around, how we're addressing those are different effects of that growth. So those are other challenges that we have to keep in mind on. Um, and then site availability, the, the real estate component is uh, a constraint. I hear about a lot of stuff coming out of the ground, and that's wonderful, because this is a massive constraint throughout the state of Florida. 
where we just don't have the actual physical location to put some of these companies and these activities that are coming in and wanting uh, to come here to Florida based on the availability of land that's properly zoned, that has all the utilities, that is really ready to go. Um, so just a bit more flavoring on some of the challenges we're seeing. Uh, obviously, my perspective uh, on all these issues is from the small business perspective. Um, and it's easy for me because it's it's ditto to all the above. Obviously, workforce is an issue for small business owners. Cost is an issue for small business owners. But just very quickly, I'll add a, a couple of issues. Uh, just I'll start with a data point. Uh, the four counties of the Treasure Coast, Indian River, St. Lucie, Martin County, in 2021, we had 11,644 new business starts. So from our perspective, obviously, we see some issues with startups. Uh, capital access issues uh, certainly is is going to be a challenge for us to to you know service and and foster these businesses as they start obviously what's happening uh, in terms of the high level economic development we've got some big companies Amazon uh, those types of organizations moving in that's going to offer us an, an entrepreneurial opportunity for startups to support these bigger companies but again capital access I see is a big issue uh, in terms of, of the uh, entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem around our marketplace. And Tom, I'll add to your, your issue of capital access. We are very hopeful that with all of the wealth that's moving to Florida, that we can tighten up and create greater access to capital. Uh, I wanted to also add on to something that Andrew said that I think is important. I think that for 20 years, there's been this perception, or maybe longer, that when you graduate from high school or college in the state of Florida, you have to go to New York or Chicago or Boston to get a job. And I think that all of us, no matter what county you come from in this region, we need to really think of ways that we can more closely align our high school students and get them early on to the jobs that are in their backyard so that they understand they don't have to do that. And then uh, Destin said something about, you know, the challenges with the properties, um, finding available sites. It is shrinking, and we have to start looking at infill sites. And so if you look around corridors where there are one-story buildings that aren't at capacity, what do we want to put on those, and how do we make sure that the transportation systems work with them. The other thing that we're seeing is that with this outside population coming in, unfortunately, they're making 30% more than what we make in the state of Florida. So they're able to buy homes 30% higher. And unfortunately, they're displacing people that have lived in our county and our region for 10, 20 years, which I think is very, very um, disappointing and hard to see because everything is either shifting north or shifting outside of the state. People that have raised their children here not really wanting to um, deal with the prices that are here. Now I'd like to shift to this conversation about transportation. In the economic development world, when we serve on the front lines, um, doesn't matter if you're placing someone at FAU's R&D Park or if you're over in St. Lucie or Palm Beach or or a small business, there is this question, thank you, Destin, drive us, drive us a small, a five mile radius around the building where I want to locate and tell me how our workers, our employees, will get to our office or our facility without ever getting in a car. Now, every, everything that I see today is you're getting in a car for the most part. Now, thank you for Brightline and for TriRail, but the other issue that I see is you have dense cities where the rents within these very popular cities, I'll throw out three in my county, Boca Raton, West Palm Beach, and Palm Beach Gardens, very desirable places to live and very desirable places to work. What's happening? The people in the buildings can't afford to live in the apartments next door. So what's happening? They're bringing their cars in now. They can't find parking in the building that they lease. And there are no more parking garages in the city. So what do we do with all these people? Talk to me about some of the transportation issues that you face, but just don't give us the issues. Give this group what you think should be the solutions. Well, Kelly. <laughs> just go straight for it. 
I beg your pardon. So uh, Kelly brings up a very important part, and there's a linkage here on transportation and labor mobility. And um, on, on behalf of uh, in the entire St. Lucie County community, Kelly, uh, we're happy to provide 60% of our workforce to Martin and Palm Beach County every day. <laughs> the hardworking, dutiful citizens of St. Lucie County hop in their car every day to go work in Martin County and Palm Beach. So, and that's from the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. So we still want to provide that to you. And we also want to still be the affordable workforce housing for all the great people that work in, in Palm Beach County. I'm so afraid that when you get <laughs> to a density level on the commercial side, that our people yeah. are no longer going to want to come and work in Palm Beach. They're going to stay in your backyard. Well, um, so we have a work local campaign, and um, I, I saw Kate... <laughs> I see Elijah Wooten and uh, Kate Parmalee were here, and we have a multimodal transit uh, system on Gatlin Boulevard, and like everybody goes down to Palm Beach County. But we have a big sign that says, hey, quit the commute, work local, because we have lots of great jobs. So um, you know, we don't want to deprive that of you, Kelly, but um, you know, we do want to provide great jobs. But in all seriousness, that, that transportation corridor is very important, I-95, the turnpike, and also the uh, secondary corridors that you know, supply not only St. Lucie County, but the Treasure Coast. So uh, our population in St. Lucie County has grown 20%. You know, we're well over 330,000, and as David Gillespie said, you know, we're going up higher. We're going to be over a half a million people. So, you know, I don't know if this is a local issue, but both federally and, and state, you know, we have to look at not only, you know, your traditional mode of, of transportation, but what other things can we do that would, um, you know, whether it's rail or other ways of uh, improving the network so we can keep moving regionally. I, that's above my pay grade, but um, that's something that maybe we could work with, particularly with our uh, respective elected officials, our county commissions, and also the state about getting more funding for, for road networks. Not much of a solution, but anyway, we're, we're worried uh, about supplying workforce and making it competitive. So I, I work every day next to some extremely brilliant researchers, many of whom are looking at freight mobility and, and moving people around the region more efficiently. Um, so I would encourage us all to look to to our universities and to our state colleges for some of those answers. On, a, on an anecdotal and personal level, I mean, I've used um, bus systems. When I, I lived in Atlanta for a short time before Kelly recruited me down to Palm Beach County, so anyone who's not happy with any of my work can blame her. Um, when I lived in Atlanta, we, we, we lived in a, in, a, in a suburb, so the, the city would pay or subsidize for a, a, it was a Greyhound bus, but it was a very nice one, to go from that suburb into the city, and then you can walk to wherever your, your workplace is. So those kinds of solutions, I think, are worth looking at, and as Pete said, light rail is a solution. While it's expensive, it needs a lot of investment and a lot of time. Um, some of these road-based uh, solutions can be put in place in the meantime. Flying cars. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. Well, vertical takeoff is actually an interesting industry that's having a lot of movement, but a, a bit more in a serious way. I mean, it has to be, you bring everything to bear, right? Every multimodal thing that you can think of, whether that's pedestrians, whether that's bikes, whether that's rideshare, you know, you bring all that to, to bear on this. Uh, interestingly enough, I think what we've seen is some of these shifts in the way that people are working. We always focus on growing the capacity of the system. Add another lane to the highway, you get more cars through. Well, you can also take cars off the road. And, you know, I think hybrid work and the adoption of hybrid working models has taken a lot of traffic off of a lot of highways. Um, so being cognizant of those types of trends and opportunities, I think, can help mitigate it. Um, but I will shift real quick because I did say people, goods, and information. So one thing I want to hit on is, and it's something that we should be doing, is making sure that we have the proper speed tests and that we are working with people like the Department of Economic Opportunity, Office of Broadband, identifying the places where signal does not have the strength, speed, and reliability. Um, it's another way to keep people off the roads, right, when you can do more work from home. 
Um, we measured things in kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, and I'm pretty sure they're already to whatever is the next kind of byte, um, which I'm not yet aware of, but I'm sure there is, that it's out there. So the stress that's putting on our information networks and systems is incredible. Um, just in the last couple of years, I'm now in a household where I can have five different devices streaming television and Hulu and all this different stuff at one time. And you know, before it was, oh, maybe two devices checking your email. Um, so that's another piece of just I want to make sure is, is part really of the Really good point. Uh, again, transportation is probably uh, a little out of our um, our skill set. So, uh, but I, I will just say this about transportation: I had occasion a couple of years ago to have to travel to Miami on a regular basis, and and I got to say, TriRail was unbelievable. I never drive to Miami again. Catch TriRail. Yeah, totally agree. And when we look at TriRail and Brightline, just anecdotally, what we're hearing from executives is that connection into the inner cores of the cities has to be a lot and has to be reliable so we can get those cars off. Uh, also, companies are asking us for scooter services so you can pick it up, take it three or four miles down the block, drop it off, no issue. And then I would also add something else very attractive. Uh, while I cover 39 cities, there's something that I've seen in downtown West Palm Beach. It's called Circuit. It's taken my car off the road at least four or five times a day if I'm traveling within the inner core of the city. It works like Uber. I think a lot of cities should consider it. It's absolutely a free service. And a little golf cart comes and picks you up, takes you to where you have to go in a five or six mile radius. And it's very, very reliable. So those are just things. There you go. Is that Raphael? Yeah, buddy. How you doing? Uh, it is absolutely brilliant, and I, it's, it works so well that when I'm showcasing a certain part of our county, I now showcase it from a golf cart as opposed to getting in my air-conditioned car. So it, 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 it works really, really well. So things for us to consider as we go into planning. So I'm going to end with one last question for all of you. From a policy perspective, what types of policies do you think that elected officials should be looking at in order to not just encourage additional growth, but maintain what we have here now? These are tough questions, Kelly. Okay, I'll throw out one idea yeah. just to get your brain flowing. I think every single government has to have an expedited permitting process for key cluster industries that are coming into our county and should ha have one point person that that company has to go to, that they should not have to go through DERM and ERM and EPA and Department of Health and FIRE, that if somebody's coming in and putting $30 million in your area, they should only have to go to one person. Well, that's great because we have all the business navigators here. <laughs> Fondra, Peter, Sarah, Elijah, we're, we're good on the expedited permitting. Thank you, Mark Satterley. He just walked out, yeah. Um, I'd like to go what to, over to what Destin said uh, about economic competitiveness, uh, particularly on uh, taxation, and then also um, the, the permitting and regulatory process. And uh, I know that our local governments are doing everything possible to provide excellent cu customer service. Um, they're also, our, our local governments are grappling with uh, being able to hire and retain professional staff. You know, if you look at the various departments uh, within local government, uh, engineering, utilities, planning, uh, public works, you know, uh, you know, trying to find a planner uh, is very difficult. And I know at least in our case, um, in fact, Thondra and I were talking today, it's like, hey, you know, can we expedite the expedited permitting uh, applications that are all in there. Like, we've, you've got 10, right? Anymore, yeah, that's, that's right. I don't want to get you in trouble, Thondra. Yeah. But yes, but anyway, uh, kind of going back to that local government side. Oh, thank you, Mark. Expedited permitting. I was just talking about you. <laughs> anyway, that, uh, I don't know how we could help in that regard with our local governments uh, to help them get... Um, Staffed uh, appropriately. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a pretty tactical, uh, simple solution, but... You know, you think about the, uh, that causal relationship of being able to expedite those permits and having the right people do it quickly, something that uh, might be easily um, uh, accomplished from a, a planning perspective. Great. 
Um, so, like my colleagues here, I try to think of economic development from a holistic perspective. So, I was really um, gratified when the Florida Chamber took on uh, the fight against generational poverty. So, um, I'm also particularly grateful to people like Senator Harrell who have taken on child welfare uh, issues within the state because the more we can get those kids on the right path, the better chance we have to be a prosperous state in the future and obviously for those individual kids to have a brighter life. So those kinds of policies are very, very important throughout the state. Um, Senator Harrell has really championed those. And, um, and then the next step is obviously investing <clears throat> appropriately in, in education from pre-K through postdoctoral um, programs so that we have an educated workforce at all stages of the system um, kids who are who are fulfilling their own potential, whether they go to state college or a university or go straight into the workforce, that they have the skills they need, that the curriculums are well funded and funded and designed by educators rather than politics and the issues of the day. Just let the kids, or students, learn what they need to learn to be effective members of society. I think those two, while they're very big issues, would do an awful lot to fix the systemic and foundational challenges we have within the state. Well, I think I would I'd challenge and encourage any local community to look at competitiveness more broadly. How do your policies fit into the overall picture of economic development and the goals of economic development? So a, a company is not necessarily concerned about when, where, how something is delivered to them as long as it's delivered to them. So I always break it down that there's three things we focus on in economic development, time, cost and uncertainty. Decrease the time until they're up operational and doing their thing, right? Decrease cost because why not? Everyone likes something that doesn't cost as much. Uncertainty, the, it's the enemy of business. Give them answers. So a lot of what we talked about with the staffing, with expedited permitting, with those types of things, that, that addresses a lot of those points. But look at it in the context, so at the state, for example. The state used to have a suite of economic development tools seven, eight, nine years ago that was rather robust and hit a ton of different categories. The economic development tools available at the state level today really are catered and geared towards much larger scale activities. Like for example, the floor for some of these programs is 100 new jobs and 25 million in capital investment. My SBDC friend probably doesn't like hearing that. So how do the local programs, how do the local policies, how are those stacked with that? If the state is addressing a certain segment, maybe your local policies need to address a different segment. Uh, the other thing I'd like to challenge is to look at economic development a little differently. We love to go out there and get the huge project, right? Let me go out there and get you 1,000 jobs, 100,000 average wage, 200, you know, 300, 400 million dollar capital investment. We'll do that all day long, we love it. That's, you know, you get to have your big trophy. Um, economic development works when you're focused on everyone, right? A lot of it's about increasing average wage. You, you increase the average wage not only by getting a lot more of the top end jobs, you get it by lifting up the bottom jobs too. And so I think our policies and programs need to be really looking at and taking into account the entirety, uh, both from the state layered with the local, but also from not just focused on these highest points, but understanding that in our, in our communities and our economies, there's a lot of nurturing and catering that needs to happen so that we can lift everyone up and ultimately have the better goals for our community. Well, again, and to, and to piggyback a little bit on that comment, and again, from a small business perspective, I think uh, one of the most important issues for us, and we learned this through the pandemic, uh, there was an awful lot of available dollars out there. There was uh, local grants, uh, there were PPPs and EITLs, and what we learned, um, through the last two years that we've got some underserved communities and some minority owned businesses that had an awful difficult time accessing those dollars. I noticed yesterday in the Tribune, there was a cover story about minority businesses struggling to get access to this capital. And from an SBDC perspective, that's an important issue for us. And we've begun to implement some programs. We've got some partners like Bank of America uh, that have uh, allotted us some dollars to, to get into those 
underserved areas and work with those minority businesses. So I love the idea of, you know, the the, the local governments uh, actually focused on some local issues. We've worked very closely with the city of Fort Pierce. We've worked very closely with the county. We're, we're working on a partnership now with St. Lucie County. We've worked with a partnership with Elijah at city of Port St. Lucie. So again, I see really, uh, you know, again, s servicing those uh, minority and underserved businesses and helping grow that up, uh, you know, as as you, as you pointed out. So, and, and again, I think the the most important issue which plays into that is capital access. We've, 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 we've absolutely got to help folks get access to capital. We recognize that is the key component for a business to grow and expand. And so it, it really, for us, it is capital access and, and making sure that we're serving uh, those communities that don't have that ready access. Thank you, Tom. So we've given you some food for thought on key issues that we're facing. Um, of course, workforce education at the top, affordable housing, transportation, access to capital, uh, in inclusion, including everybody. And I think that as economic developers, we're, we're very focused on making sure that it's jobs for all residents of all of our areas at all different levels. I want to thank our panelists for being a part of this very important discussion. Uh, thank you all for your attention today and enjoy your lunch. <laughs>